One of the most universal experiences amongst us humans are the moments spent gazing into the cosmic time map of the stars. Many of us have wondered if other life exists. How did it all begin? What does this all mean? These questions drove me to the stars from a very young age. And by grade school, I was already reading college level literature in everything relating to astronomy and astrophysics. Still, my hunger for knowledge was insatiable. For every question answered, 10 more would sprout in its place. Why are we here? How did life come to be in such hellish conditions? What about space itself? Could life exist out there in the freezing black void? The answer isn't what you'd expect. You have no reason to believe a word I say. And even so, this message may not reach you at all. But I won't let our sacrifices go unheard. I have to leave a record in case I don't make it back to tell you this myself. I have to try. For everyone back home on Earth. For Dr. Bigham. For Weaver. Our mission was top secret. Our purpose and destination unknown until just before launch. We were told we were selected to test the first spacecraft constructed for faster than light travel. The mythical all kubir drive, my mentor and colleague, Dr. Avon Bigham, through some miracle of science and technology, had created it. Ever the stubborn mule, Dr. Bigham only reluctantly invited the world's most elite scientists and engineers to finalize the ship's construction and personally selected the crew from a pool of participants around the globe. Dr. Bigham had been my hero when I was attending university. He had such a fire in his soul for astronomy and would reject all absolutes when it came to physics. Nothing is impossible, was his mantra. He would talk endlessly about how faster than light travel could be possible how humanity could harvest the power of black holes and become the titans of the universe. It was our destiny. His passion was infectious, and so I made it my own life's goal to see humanity finally gain access to the stars. Our endless nights and research finally paid off with the creation of the space research vehicle, Arkham. I was in complete shock and didn't think any of it was real. Not when we arrived on Luna to begin basic training. Not when we arrived on Titan to begin final preparations. Not until the moment when I was floating naked in the suspended animation tank, preparing for our four-year trip to the edge of the solar system. There, our journey would truly begin. Hypersleep, in actuality, was nothing like any movie or program I'd ever seen. There was nothing to keep me warm for the 20 minutes it would take to enter hypersleep. My eyes were bound shut with surgical tape, so my only sensation was the piercing cold of the sub-zero degree water. The pain was excruciating, but the only reminder that I was even still alive. I was sure I would die before stasis was triggered, but in that same second, it finally happened and I felt the inky black of space completely take over. For once, I was happy to be asleep. I don't remember a single dream I've ever had, having been an insomniac for much of my life. But I remember the dream from hypersleep. I was lost at sea. The ocean was deep black and was almost bottomless. There was a sky but its deep midnight purple hue was almost indistinguishable from the Black Sea. The darkness masked the shadow of the many creatures I could sense just inches below my feet. Once or twice, I felt what seemed like rows of teeth running ever so softly down my legs. It could have been for just a moment, or maybe an eternity. But without warning or pain, 
I was pulled downward and plunged straight into the abyss. I didn't dare open my eyes. All I could do was pray for a quick death. The first sense I regained was the wave of warmth that washed over my exposed, water-locked body. I couldn't see yet, but I could feel my fingers were soaked and rubbery from such a long submersion. Quickly afterward, I became aware of a flurry of voices. Some were muffled and distant. Another was close and clearer. It was Weaver, our medical technician, just awakening from hypersleep himself. I remember that he'd been the first doctor to practice on Mars, and as my eyes opened slowly and his nearly perfect physique, at even 50 plus years of age, was alluring and helped me bring my other senses into focus. Without warning, my ears were filled with sharp shooting pain. The blaring alarm overhead quickly forced the remaining fogginess to retreat. I knew this alarm. I had heard it before. It was the life support fail system Dr. Bigham and I had designed together. A growing dread replaced the momentary excitement I had only felt seconds ago. I turned over quickly, splashing water everywhere to see who it was. It was Dr. Bigham. It had happened only once before in recorded spaceflight. But he went into cardiac arrest the exact moment he entered stasis. His heart was now failing without the machines to keep him alive. Weaver was the first to reach him and frantically began performing CPR. It was all in vain, as the all too familiar sound of a flatlining heart monitor were the only things we could hear outside Weaver's desperate pleas. Roberts, the ship's captain, rushed to stop Weaver's endless compressions, knowing it was too late. The next few hours were a haze as the rest of the crew awakened and processed how to go forward. There was a plan, as there always was. There was no joy to be had logging into the mainframe to assume the title of chief science officer. I had hoped to one day lead my own expedition into the void. I never wanted it to be like this. As the other crew were grieving and dealing with post-stasis recovery, I turned the ship on, sector by sector, and began plotting our course. That's when I noticed it. It was peculiar at first. I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. I tried to align the ship with Alpha Centauri, but the ship's computers kept failing to plot a course. I knew I was doing everything correctly. My very soul had been embedded into this ship. I knew every circuit and every switch on the bridge. Troubled. I looked out into the expanse of interstellar space that lay right in front of me. My eyes searched for familiar constellations and areas I knew I would recognize. Once I found one, I tried tracing it back to the spot where I knew Alpha Centauri was. Only, I didn't find it. I searched every point in the sky. But no matter how long I searched, I could not find Alpha Centauri anywhere. This was impossible, surely some kind of post-traumatic stress from the voyage in stasis and now Dr. Bigham's unfortunate passing. As far as our scans could detect, our destination had gone dark. An unease unlike anything I'd ever experienced crept over me. The mysterious nature of our mission and lack of any details before launch was starting to make sense. Dr. Bigham must have known. How many others knew? What else had the doctor been hiding? I said nothing, as the rest of the crew silently entered the presentation room. Roberts was doing her best to maintain appearances. But rumors of romance with the doctor had been floating around for months before our launch. Now, her stark and blank expression was more worrying than normal. Captain, I need to address the crew. I was shaky and unsure as I spoke. Roberts was a commanding figure within the crew, a no-nonsense stronghold of a woman who could drink me under the table before beating me over the head with it. It can wait until after the briefing. Her words were stern and cut through the bone. I'm sorry, with all due respect, but it can't wait. 
There's something I've just discovered and that was an order, Blair. Now, please start the presentation and have a seat. You may speak after the briefing. Her words were a swift rebuke of my desperate pleas. For me, that confirmed she already knew what Dr. Bigham was about to posthumously tell us. Quietly, I obeyed her instructions and started the recorded memos the late doctor had left. His haggard face flashed up on the screen. The deep ridges in his skin prominent and his hazel eyes looking straight into the camera from behind his absurdly oversized glasses. There was a deadly seriousness to his expression. A rarity for him. Whatever the reason for Alpha Centauri's sudden disappearance, it was taking quite the effect on him. The knot of anxiety and dread that had formed in my stomach was now twisting into a monumental sense of grave danger for all of us. Fellow crew of the Arkham, it will have been my greatest failure should these recordings ever reach you. For all it means that my life's work and my journey alongside you to Alpha Centauri have failed. Now, I must place upon you the most terrible of burdens. His words dripped with both heartache and a slowly rising fear. I could hear nothing but the labored breaths of my crew as we listened. By now, you have cleared the Oort Cloud and are in the final preparations to perform the very first hyperspace jump using the immaculately designed jump drive of my own creation. You know this to be your primary and only objective to oversee the first successful faster than light voyage to our closest stellar neighbor, the star system designated Alpha Centauri, then return home. This is only half true. The bomb, the one we were all waiting for. Of course, there had been more to this mission than just simply testing the drive. Why else had a heavily decorated military commander with extensive combat experience be made the captain of a scientific mission? I looked over at Captain Roberts and was surprised to meet her gaze in return. Her attention could not be further away from Dr. Bigham's posthumous presentation. Instead, she appeared to be studying me, looking for my reaction. Maybe she thought I knew as well that Dr. Bigham had already told me before the mission. My confused and puzzled face must have surprised her as she turned away the same second our eyes had met. What you're about to hear is considered top secret by every recognized sovereign body on Earth. Four years before the start of our voyage, an amateur astronomer reported a strange finding to NASA. It seemed that our nearest stellar neighbor, Alpha Centauri, had suddenly and without warning vanished from sight. There was a murmur of conversation amongst the crew now. An entire star system vanished? Impossible. Surely a miscalculation. Hearing these words coming from Dr. Bigham's mouth, I still didn't believe it. There was no precedent for this. A star cannot simply vanish, especially not the star closest to us. Dr. Bigham paused for a few moments, allowing us to absorb the full weight of what his words meant. I noticed his hands trembling, a condition he had kept hidden from most. They hadn't stopped shaking the entire video. Repeated attempts to locate the binary star system have all failed. Proxima Centauri, the third member of the system, is still detectable, but we have been receiving strange oddities and fluctuations in output. You may remember some years back when astronomers reported similar findings from Tabby's star. Your primary destination is now Proxima Centauri, specifically the region of the planet located within the Red Dwarf's habitable zone. You will make your initial observations there. A crew of two will then board the ship's emergency shuttle, which has also been outfitted with a jump drive and charter route to the site of Alpha Centauri. You will record any data there is to be obtained, then report back to the Arkham. If all succeeds, you will then chart a course back to your present location to begin the journey back to Titan. The severity of your situation must not be underestimated. There is no natural or physical phenomenon that we have ever recorded that is remotely capable of producing this anomaly. Besides, there is something even more disturbing. 
I've traced star maps from all across history, and there is a direct line of stars that have all seemingly disappeared throughout the galaxy that led directly to Alpha Centauri. This anomaly, whatever it is, does appear to be spreading. I'm sure I don't have to tell you which system is closest to Proxima Centauri. Also, there is the nature of the jump drive themselves. All you need to know is that they are powered by an extremely volatile engine, and miscalculations and impact debris are high risk factors. So you must proceed with the utmost caution. You are all truly in no man's land now. The doctor took a long pause, perhaps growing weary from the weight of this information. He ran his hands through his thinning curly grey hair, then took one final look at the camera. One can only hope these files never reach you, and that we will together solve this mystery. But if not, if these truly are my last words to you, then Godspeed. With that, the screen went blank, and a heavily uncomfortable silence cloaked the entire room. The one sound that registered with me were the occasional beeps from the ship. Roberts was the first to speak up. Blair, you may now address the crew, she said with just a hint of sarcasm. No need now, Dr. Bigham pretty much covered it. I said blankly, still locked into a gaze with the blank screen. My mind was racing over the possibilities, over what could have happened to Alpha Centauri and the other stars Dr. Bigham had mentioned. What was more troubling to me was the mention of Tabby Star, which has indeed recorded bizarre fluctuations in light output. Some have speculated that an advanced alien race could be constructing a Dyson Swarm around the star, though no solid theories have ever been conclusively proven or disproven. This was something completely different though. Tabby Star was still detectable, whereas two whole stars from a system were now entirely gone. Proxima Centauri, a low-mass red dwarf, appeared to be next, but as it was not visible to the naked eye, we would have no idea of what we would see until we got there. Roberts took notice of the shocked expression of the entire crew, and for the first time, spoke with just the slightest hint of concern in her voice. Dr. Bigham left detailed instructions for everyone to follow in the event of his death. Does anyone have any questions before we begin? It didn't take long for the first protest to start. Torrance, the ship's pilot, and Roberts, second in command, was the first. Are you kidding me? This is insane. There is no way we can go through with this mission now that we just lost our only scientist. His fear and anger were clear as he almost spat through his teeth. Torrance and I had once both been peers of Dr. Bigham before I was chosen to be his assistant. Our already fragile and competitive relationship quickly soured after that, and Torrance threw himself head first into piloting. I agree, we have no clue what to expect when we get there, and now we've lost Dr. Bigham. I think we should test the jump drive to get back to Seoul. It would be a far better course of action now, in light of what's happened. I was surprised to hear Weaver joining in with Torrance. Weaver had a reputation for being rash and making risky choices that ended up saving countless lives. But now, he too was cloaked in the same fear everyone else was. We cannot risk damaging the ship by flying through the Oort Cloud. That's precisely why we had to wait until we had cleared it to begin the mission. As you have already been told, there are specific instructions. Torrance cut Roberts off which was something no one had ever dared to do. The rest of the crew, shocked at his bravado, just looked on as their dispute continued to escalate. I don't care, this is well beyond normal circumstances. Not only is the man who built this ship dead, but this whole mission was also all a lie. I would have never signed up for this if I had known the truth. And I'm sure most of you wouldn't have either. Torrance looked to be out of breath as he finished. He was scared. I could tell. Whatever concern and humanity Roberts had displayed earlier was swiftly replaced with her usual icy demeanor. But you did sign up for this mission. You signed an ironclad contract. 
Now of course I cannot force you to participate. Our superiors are trillions of miles away. If you refuse however, we will forcibly place you back into stasis until the completion of this mission and I'll return to Titan, where you will be placed under arrest and stripped of your title, status and all privileges. I have to admit, there was something provocative and sensual the way Roberts took control of any situation. I could see Torrance beginning to shrink in the presence of such a commanding woman. No doubt the both of them wanted to curb stomp the other. Still, Torrance had never been able to read the room. And so he continued on his tirade. I'd like to see you try. Seriously, I'll fight every single one of you. No one's forcing me to do anything. Torrance was really trying to put on a brave front. But it just shattered completely in the face of someone who was clearly bigger, more powerful and more intimidating than him. If someone didn't interject soon, this was not going to end well. As Roberts began making a motion towards Torrance, thinking on my feet, I jumped up to place myself between the two. Stop, both of you, this isn't helping. My voice was shaky and I didn't feel near the confidence I was trying to project. Roberts, taken aback, could only stare at me with her mouth slightly agape. Torrance, however, looked poised to attack at any moment. My feet stood firm though, and I continued. Torrance, I know you're scared. I'm scared too. You heard what Dr. Begum said. This isn't about us. It's about everyone else back on Earth. Screw you, Blair. What else do you know? You had your hand so far up Dr. Begum's ass. He must have told you everything. Torrance was becoming even more aggressive. I knew it was only a matter of time before Roberts forced her way back between us. I didn't know, I swear, I only found out just before you did. I wouldn't have agreed to come either had I known the truth. I lied, hoping Torrance would take the bait. Nothing short of a gamma ray burst would have stopped me from joining this mission. We all signed the same contract, Torrance, and there are 10 billion people that are counting on us. Not to mention everything that will be within our grasp once this ship is fully activated. The whole Milky Way galaxy, Andromeda, the local group, maybe even the entire observable universe. I know you Torrance, and I know there's no way you wouldn't want to be a part of that. We need you. I stopped, allowing Torrance to absorb what I had just said. His shoulders began to relax, and I could sense his breathing returning to normal. Roberts looked on suspiciously. Well, now that we've all regained composure, we will initiate the first jump to Proxima Centauri in T-1 hour. You may begin your preparations. Dismissed. Roberts didn't stay any longer and disappeared into her personal quarters. Not able to stand the thought of everyone staring at me, I left without a word and headed to the bridge. As I mindlessly brought all the systems online, the only thing I could think about was Alpha Centauri. Nothing but titanic darkness lay in the spot where our closest neighbor once was. What could have possibly caused an entire binary star system to disappear? The only real option in my head was some sort of black hole encounter. Maybe a rogue black hole that remained undetected disrupted the system, sending Alpha Centauri A and B into interstellar space. Even that remote possibility stretched my suspicion of disbelief well beyond its limits. The bridge doors opened, but I didn't register it at first, so the hand on my shoulder was quite a jolt. I jumped back to see Sydney, the most senior astronaut outside Roberts. She hasn't said a word during the presentation and resulting aftermath, but I could tell from her pale expression that she harbored fear of her own. Oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. She sputtered sincerely. Sydney was the exact opposite of Roberts in almost every conceivable way, and in many respects reminded me a great deal of Dr. Begum. She had joined the NASA space program right out of college and was the first woman to set foot on the Titan at just 27 years old. The subsequent decade spent in space had taken a toll on her physical appearance, but her natural curiosity of the unknown still kept her from settling down. It's okay, I assured her, 
turning my head back towards the expanse of space. I could sense Sydney was equally entranced by the view before us. Despite our now unprecedented and worrying circumstances, it was still a marvel of technical achievement to be able to see what we're seeing. The countless specks of glimmering light shining from hundreds and thousands of light years away were a living time capsule of an era long past. Is everything ready? Sydney asked half-heartedly. I could sense her unease. It was cold and familiar. Yeah, just waiting for the rest of the crew to join us before we begin charging up the engine. It felt hollow just saying those words as I had no idea what was even powering this ship. Dr. Begum had cherished my devotion to him and his dream, but for some reason hadn't thought it prudent to include me in every aspect of its construction. This had infuriated me before, but now it only fueled my growing discomfort at having to fill in his shoes. This was truly a case of the blind leading the blind. What do you think happened to it? Her voice trembled. Alpha Centauri? I have no idea. I have my theories, each one more implausible than the next. I finally turned to face her, but she kept her gaze forward. Sydney's almost ruby hair fell into curls all the way down to her neck, framing her narrow face. Her eyes looked glazed over, like she was seeing beyond space, beyond the cosmic horizon. I don't think I want to know. Whatever it is, it can't be good. Sydney couldn't have known just how right she was. The rest of the crew began filling in one by one, with Roberts being the last to join us. She was still trying to hide her pain behind a wall of emotional indifference, but smeared eyeliner betrayed her true heart of hearts. I felt for her and admired her supreme courage. Torrance, however, made his contempt well known, rudely brushing past me as he made his way to his co-pilot chair. Roberts made her way to the front of the bridge before stopping to gaze into the abyss. I wondered what monsters, if any, gazed back onto her. Blair, are we ready to begin? She asked blankly, not even looking back at us as she strapped herself in her chair. All systems are online and ready, I replied. Torrance, have we aligned the ship with Proxima Centauri? Torrance let out a reluctant, yes with as much venom as he could muster. Good. Begin the charging sequence, Blair. My fingers hover over the buttons needed to trigger the charging sequence. This was the moment we had all been waiting for. We were about to engage in the first faster than light voyage to another star system. This was bigger than the moon landing, bigger than anything humanity had ever attempted before. But more than that, our entire perspective of the universe was about to change in a single moment. It was a terrifying prospect, and I wasn't sure I even wanted to know what awaited us at Proxima Centauri. Blair, is there a problem? Roberts asked curtly. No, no problem, Captain. Then please begin the charging sequence. That had been the first time I had ever heard her utter the word please. Even under the circumstances, I was very much enjoying this less hardened version of Roberts. Without saying a word, I began the charging sequence. My anxiety was through the roof and I had trouble staying focused, entering in the wrong sequence of codes more than once. It took close to two minutes before the telltale sounds of the particle accelerator connecting from the bridge to the engine room began blaring in our ears. The entire bridge began to vibrate slowly at first, but increased in intensity as the drive powered on. I looked around me, studying the crew. Some of them had locked their eyes onto me, but turned away the second mine had intercepted their own. Torrance's expression had changed from just barely contained anger to outright hostility. Sydney was still staring ahead into space along with Roberts. 
I only caught a glimpse of Weaver before he turned away, but his expression was one of both abject terror and hesitation. At long last, the charging sequence had completed, and the ship's computer informed us that the jump drive was now ready for initiation. I looked back to Roberts, who turned her head just slightly in my direction. On my command, she said. I took the longest and deepest breath I had ever taken in my life, then braced my mind, body and soul for whatever was about to come next. Roberts couldn't have known it at the time, but her next words sealed her fate as well as ours. Initiate. There was no pause, no hesitation this time, just the flip of a single switch. All at once, the sounds coming from the particle accelerator increased by almost a hundredfold. My teeth were threatening to shatter from the intense vibration that echoed through every part of my body. I could hear the surging discomfort coming from the crew. Sydney had begun hyperventilating and needed oxygen fast. But before I was able to disengage her emergency mask, the jump drive activated. What followed next was an experience that borders somewhere between pure ecstasy and a living nightmare. From the back of the ship, an enormous force started pulling us backward. I was sure I was about to face right through my chair. Space itself distorted in front of us as our view of the universe contracted and then expanded. The pressure was gargantuan, like being on a roller coaster going 1000 miles per hour. My skin had flattened against my body, the way it does when you run your hands underneath an air dryer. I couldn't even turn my head an inch to see the rest of the crew, and the roar of the ship masked any cries they made. Trillions of miles flew past in an instant, closing the gap between us and Proxima Centauri. This was it, our monumental achievement in engineering. Against all odds, it had worked. At first, the space in front of us remained dark and empty. After what felt like only seconds, a pale red dot appeared on the horizon. Proxima Centauri loomed ahead, growing bigger and brighter with each passing second. The ship's computer reminded me to begin deceleration, and with great difficulty, I moved my fingers over the switch and immediately felt the ship begin to slow down. Just moments later, the entire ship jolted and sparks began to fly from overhead. Something had impacted the ship. This was not good. A second later, another impact caused another shower of sparks to shower down all around us. Screams from some of the crew, mostly Sydney, reverberated all around me. This had not been foreseen, as there were no detectable asteroid fields along our projected path. Our calculations had been so precise. From over the chorus of voices and screams, I could hear Roberts attempting to give out orders to remain calm, but they fell upon deaf ears. Warning, damage, critical. Engage, emergency deceleration. This wasn't good. Our shield generator was failing. Blair, engage the emergency stop. Roberts ordered from underneath another torrent of sparks. We can't stop at these speeds, the g-forces will destroy the ship. Roberts protested, but I knew what would happen if I listened to her. We could do nothing but wait, pray we had cleared the debris field and stay calm. The ship stopped jolting and once the ship reached the minimum safe speed, I disengaged the jump drive. The ship lurched forward violently, nearly ripping us out of our seats. The structural integrity of the ship had held up, but only just. Multiple systems were offline, and all of our communication channels were down. I unbuckled myself quickly to begin surveying the damage, blocking out the cries and attempts at Roberts to maintain control. There were more important things to deal with right now. As far as I could see, our storage compartment housing our ground survey equipment was compromised so there was no telling how much equipment we had just lost. The shuttle was fully operational from what I could tell, as was the jump drive itself. 
but the backup generators and reserve cooling system needed to be repaired before we could even think about booting up the drive again. It was when I heard Weaver pushing himself in between Roberts and Torrance that I knew I had to intervene. I shouted for everyone to shut up and listen. As best as I could, I told them what we had to do right now if we wanted to stand a chance at getting back home. The energy in the room changed instantly. Despite the near-death experience and growing feuds, the crew immediately sprang into action. Roberts took advantage of this to assert control, but I could tell from several faces that this wouldn't last long. Torrance and I went to assess the cargo hold, hoping that the breach was small. We were dismayed to find the compartment had been wrecked by the breach. Several small holes had created enough suction to pull most of the equipment to the walls. Sparks were flying everywhere, and from the looks of it, our planetary surveillance rover was in pieces all over the ceiling. We would need to patch the holes before we could enter. Weaver joined us as Roberts watched on from the cockpit. She had continued to bark orders at everyone, but she was losing her cool as most of them had gone unheard or ignored. There was nothing she hated more than losing her authority. Torrance was back to his passive-aggressive routine, so that left only Weaver and me to try and maintain the peace. As we worked, my eyes kept drifting to Proxima Centauri, enraptured by its glowing red light and dominance of the pitch-black sky. We managed to patch all the holes and repressurize the compartment. Not that it did us much good. All of our data collection modules and survey equipment had been trashed, leaving us with no way to scan the planets in the Proxima Centauri system. Not that it would matter anyways. When we were back aboard the ship, Sydney dropped yet another bomb on the crew. The planet that had been our original destination was no longer detectable just like Alpha Centauri A and B. By this point, I had lost my ability to be shocked. Torrance, in a fit of anger, swung at Weaver as he tried to come in between him and Roberts again. I dove in to try and block him and ended up getting the full brunt of his fist to my left temple. The last thing I remember is my body hitting the floor before the pitch black took over again. No dreams this time, thankfully. When I awoke, Weaver was standing over me, looking as striking as ever. He smiled at me, a smile I returned in kind. Had our circumstances been different, I'd be resisting a powerful urge to kiss him. Instead, the weight of our situation collapsed on top of me almost instantly. Weaver said that Torrance was in isolation, with Roberts just one click away from placing him back into stasis. As I got up, the wave of searing pain in my temples nearly put me back on the table. Weaver gave me some beautiful pink pill that instantly put my throbbing headache at ease. Roberts wants us all back on the bridge as soon as you're ready, Weaver replied. I silently agree and left with him at once. When we arrived back on the bridge, Torrance had been let out of isolation but was still brooding in the corner by himself. I could feel the hate radiating off of him while Roberts looked almost disheveled and not her usual self. As soon as she saw me, she walked right over and pulled me away from Weaver. Blair, I know Dr. Bigham personally selected you for this portion of the mission. However, after Torrance's outburst and the discovery of the missing planets, I'm overriding his directives and will be accompanying Torrance myself. I thought she was kidding at first, but her stern and cold expression said otherwise. With all due respects, Captain Roberts, Dr. Brigham stated, Roberts cut me off before I could even protest. I know what he said. I was there. I know how to collect and analyze data, Blair. What I don't know are the ins and outs of the ship. And if something happens to you before the ship is operational again, we might never get back to Earth. Also, there is the matter of Torrance. His behavior is unpredictable at this point. And if he gets in the way of the mission, I'm not sure you'll be able to do what is necessary to prevent him from interfering. She was right. Torrance may have hated me by that point, but I didn't think I was capable of what Roberts could effortlessly do in the same situation. 
So I silently nodded my head in agreement, knowing there was nothing I could do to change her mind. There was still plenty of work that needed to be done on the ship. That much was true. Sydney and I would also have ample opportunity to collect what data we could from the Proxima Centauri system and hopefully repair some of the damaged modules. Still, part of me yearned to see what had become of Alpha Centauri, if there was anything else left to see. Robert asked for a status update on repairs, which I told her were still ongoing, but that the shuttle was up and ready for launch. Torrance made a scene as usual when told it would be him and Roberts piloting the shuttle to the Alpha Centauri system, but was otherwise undisruptive. Roberts then told everyone that once she was off the ship, I was effectively in charge until she was back. I was to oversee the final repairs and collect what data we could. I walked the two of them to the loading dock silently, watched them suit up, then bade them one final goodbye. Roberts nodded her head in return, but I was surprised when Torrin spoke up. Good luck, soldier. There was something so stark, so brutal, the way he said those famous last words. I could only straighten my back and smile in return. The airlock doors slid into place, cutting off contact with my fellow crew for the last time. <laughs>